this webinar is part of the Best Practices webinar series, and the series is funded by the Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration, MCI, and will be a resource in the Directory of Best Practices. A link to the directory can be found in the event listing on Tutela. The webinar can also be accessed at the following link. Today's Best Practice webinar, Using Reflection in Language Classroom. Hello, my name is Anna Bartosik, and I am happy to present this recorded webinar to the TESOL Ontario uh, group. Hello, I'm a, uh, my name is Anna Bartosik, and I'm a PhD student at OISE, and I've taught ESL and LINK classes over the course of my career. I'm a curriculum designer and a teacher in higher education. I'm a doctoral student. I have interests that include instructional design, motivation and teacher development, as well as incorporating educational technology into teaching practice. I develop online and blended learning courses, and I work on curriculum development. I produce some of the TESOL Ontario webinars, and I am also an instructor for pre-service ESL teachers. One of the topics I'm pursuing for my research is reflection in teacher development, and I'm very happy to present this recorded webinar. So let's take a look at the objectives for today. Um, I'd like to first talk about the history and some concepts to consider about reflect reflective practice and where reflective practice should take place in addition to including ideas for research. Uh, then I'd like to talk about incorporating elements of reflection into our teaching practice, specifically where to incorporate elements of reflection. Uh, then, excuse me, we'll move on to examples of reflection. Uh, I'll be sharing some of my own reflections, um, both written and uh, in digital form. And then I'll do a bit of a guided activity in finding opportunities to find reflection within a lesson plan. And if there's time tonight, then we might do two. So there's a long history of reflective practice in education. We can go back to Dewey of the Dewey Decimal System fame. Uh, the most famous work began with Schoen, who introduced reflection in action and reflection on action. And this is still a popular method, and these methods are referred to often, but reflections in various disciplines such as um, health sciences, which is connected to experiential learning, is common as well. It's not just in language teaching that reflective practice is taking place in education. Uh, so reflecting in action is thinking and reflecting about your practice while you're teaching, and reflecting on action is to think about how things went uh, after the event. Thomas Farrell writes a lot about reflective practice in English language teaching. He's a professor at Brock University, and um, his writing demonstrates reflective practice. If you look at his uh, earlier work and move to today, you see that there is a shift in his perception about reflection. His claim about language uh, teaching training is that he was not prepared for teaching and that language teacher education programs need to incorporate reflective practice in order to support the early years of teaching. And I know today's webinar is about uh, reflective practice in the classroom, but uh, his belief is that if we believe would begin with language teacher education programs and start reflection there, um, it will help teachers, especially novice teachers, through the first few years of, um, of teaching and help them with, uh, with those first few years. Uh, there is some weakness in the research on teacher reflection because there's a lack of longitudinal uh, data. So participants who participate in um, reflective practice for research purposes may only be reflecting because they're participating in the research project. So perhaps they know the researcher and they want to help them com uh, complete a project. Sometimes people are interested in the topic, but they still want to um, 
make the researcher happy. And so the motivation for starting reflection wasn't necessarily intrinsic, although uh, a lot of uh, people talk about benefiting from it. So a possibility for examining extended periods of reflection is exploring secondary data in digital forms. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that indirectly today when um, I talk about my own experiences, such as um, in blogs, which I'll share today with you, or social media posts. So reflection on events can occur in retrospect and they are captured in digital form in my case, but they can be captured in many different uh, various formats. So if we think about those reflections that were done not for the purposes of reflective practice, but just because we wanted to, that um, they are more accurate reflection of one's thinking process at the time of writing as uh, social media blog posts and um, blogs are not written with the intention of providing data for a research project but they continue over the course of a period of time and will most likely continue because of the author's intrinsic motivation to share ideas. Um, that is certainly one large form of reflective practice where um, people tweet, post things on Facebook, uh, write blogs, but, <clears throat> excuse me, not everything about reflection is written or digital. There are excellent uh, additional ideas for reflection and uh, Karen Johnson writes on teacher development and suggests quite a few of them. And I'm sure as I talk to you about them that uh, you'll recognize these. So one of them is having a critical friends group. Uh, in this, uh, a group of peers listen to the dilemma of one peer and then work as a group to find a solution to the presented problem. A facilitator can keep the group on topic and manages who speaks when. There's also peer coaching. Uh, peer co peers take the time to observe their other peers while teaching and they provide feedback based on their discussion before observations and what was noted during the observations. So in this case uh, teachers are being observed in their classrooms. In some places this is called uh, team teach, uh, no sorry, uh, teaching squares or classroom observations. Classroom observations don't always just take place in pre-service uh, education when teachers are part of a teaching training program. They can also take place while uh, people are teaching. Now, um, teachers have to be open to being observed, but um, in the post-conference stage of being observed, the two peers discuss the feedback and what could be done with the future. So this can be done easily uh, at a workplace between two colleagues that have a good relationship with each other. There's also mentoring, and um, this can be done in a mentor or a mentee role. So in either case, meeting with your mentor, so if you have someone, perhaps you are a newer teacher, and you really admire the way this one teacher is teaching, you could ask them to help mentor you, and you can talk about the different experiences that you have, but uh, you could also ask for a mentor when you're an experienced or an established teacher. Uh, maybe there is a new theme or a new topic um, that you want to teach and you're not exactly sure how you might uh, approach this. So you might have a mentor for that. Or you could take on mentees where you are the mentor. And uh, in either case, meeting with your mentor or mentee offers a chance to reflect on each other's observations and perspectives. There's also lesson studies, and this is very common in elementary schools where groups of teachers that are um, trying to save time and be efficient will meet, and um, it's essentially group lesson planning. Instead of one teacher creating a lesson plan for a class, a group of teachers use their resources to create the lesson plan. Only one teacher will perform the lesson plan in front of the class while the rest of the group observes and takes notes. So this is the interesting portion where you have teachers watching the lesson take place. Perhaps in elementary schools, this happens quite a bit where teachers develop lesson plans together, but this added element of um, watching the teaching take place and the group observes and takes notes and they get to discuss afterwards what happened in the lesson and how they can revise that lesson. And then the revised lesson is then taught with the other teachers. Then there is also something called cooperative development, which involves a speaker and an understander, and those are in air quotes, to have a conversation in which the 
understander reflects what the speaker says. And this allows the speaker to see connections or themes that they would have otherwise missed on their own. Teacher study groups allow teachers to do action research or teacher research to examine their practices, reflect on their work, and see what they can do uh, change or do differently. It's often a partnership between schools and professional associations or agencies. So it provides insight for researchers and teacher educators. So let's talk now about incorporating elements of reflection. And um, this can be done in a number of ways. Uh, I have some guiding questions here that might assist you in getting started, whether you want to write something down or you want to try one of those ideas that Johnson has suggested. So you have some questions that you should consider when you are um, incorporating elements of reflection. First of all, how can I collect information about my teaching? Do I feel comfortable having someone observe my lesson? Um, perhaps I want to set up a camera to record it. If that uh, doesn't make me feel comfortable, I can do what I'm doing with all of you now. Uh, I'm recording my screen and I'm talking, so that element gets captured. Uh, but students, um, interactions, anything we do physically in the classroom doesn't get captured. Perhaps I want to take notes. Perhaps I might do a sketch. So there are lots of ways that we can um, collect information about our teaching, but that's something that you should consider. Um, the, the most important question, I think, is uh, what are my beliefs about teaching and learning? What is my, my teaching philosophy? Many employers now ask that question, so it's a good idea to consider it for employment purposes. But I think this is where we must begin. Where do I come from? What is my belief about teaching? That is an excellent place to start. How do my beliefs influence my teaching? So we'll explore that as well. Where uh, do my beliefs come from? So do they come from my own learning? When I was a student in the classroom as a young person or a student in the classroom in teacher education programs? Was it my training? Um, do my beliefs influence my teaching because of the classroom practice I have? I know that when I started as a um, link teacher that my beliefs about teaching changed very much and very quickly after just a few semesters teaching uh, newly arrived uh, people to Canada. Do my beliefs perhaps come from research? Am I influenced uh, by my colleagues? So many of us claim that we have beliefs about our practices, but how we teach is not always reflective of that. So at, uh, at OISE, uh, a lot of us have classes with Master of Teaching students, and when they go and do their practicum, they'll come back and reflect and they say that uh, now um, they're most likely teaching in uh, FSL, French as a second language classes, whether they're immersion or core French or um, a combination of the two. And uh, a, a common thing that I've heard from them is that the, the teacher claims that they are a communicative language teacher and they use communicative practices but the students, when they go to observe at first, don't see very many examples of it. And um, am I being influenced by the way that I was taught? Do we revert back to that? So reflective practice can help us uh, identify those moments too. Another question to consider is, uh, what do my students believe about teaching and learning? Um, I think that's a very important question to consider because what they believe might influence how I teach and what I teach and when I teach it. Um, how do I see my role as a teacher? This is something also to consider. Uh, Kumarava Adebelu in his book Beyond Methods says that teachers go through phases in teaching and he claims that each is a successive phase. So we start in one place and we move to the next stage and then the next stage, which is the, the ultimate goal. So. Um, he says that we should aspire to move beyond the teacher as a passive technician where the teacher has the knowledge and transmits that knowledge to uh, students to move to a reflective practitioner, which is what we're talking about today. But he also claims that there is a much more important level to go to, which is to become a transformative intellectual. And a transformative intellectual um, might be interested in areas of social justice, 
um, topics that are difficult to discuss. And if, if we're interested in issues of social justice and want to incorporate them into our teaching, so teaching language is more than teaching language, it can be teaching culture, it can be teaching um, ideas, it could be teaching morals. Before we go there, I, I think that we first need to reflect as practitioners. Um, for example, I'm recording this uh, and it is uh, Monday, the week of June 24th, 2019. Um, and I've just noted some of the things that have happened in the news in the past week, things that were difficult to talk about. So to what extent would you be willing or able to discuss, for example, Sudan's political situation right now, um, the movement in the Czech Republic to oust their leader because of fraud and corruption, the protests that have been happening weekly, sometimes uh, twice a week in Hong Kong, um, discussing Im Im immigration and refugees. What does it mean? The comparison to the U.S. right now with the um, the situation of the border in the U.S. Uh, and the horrible conditions that children, uh, not just adults, but children are, are found in. Can, can I address that in the classroom? Am I comfortable addressing it in classroom? The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, do I have enough knowledge to talk about Indigenous peoples, um, comparing refugees from Syria to the situation of the Vietnamese boat people almost 40 years ago. Uh, would I have the knowledge, the ability, the language to talk about yesterday's pride parade in my classroom? And if I'm comfortable or not comfortable talking about any of these things, that's something to reflect on. And that helps us consider, again, what our philosophy is, what are our beliefs, how our students' uh, beliefs and knowledge about teaching can influence us and where we feel comfortable in the classroom and do we want to move uh, in a different direction. But reflection and introspection are important elements of professional development, but they should be used as tools uh, and not necessarily the main source of knowledge or, or change for the teacher. So if we think back, so this is one thing about considering what we want to do, but if we think back in time and consider what uh, what we were doing this time a year ago in the classroom or our first few months or even the first year of teaching. Our human memories can be distorted every time that they are remembered, right? So just, excuse me, by the act of engaging in narrative inquiry, a teacher may misremember and mis, mis pardon me, represent an event of their classroom. So how could that be mitigated if we're trying to recall or remember things and reflect on them and see how we could do things differently? First of all, let's focus on consistencies between multiple events as opposed to one event that, that may help. So if I want to um, reflect on um, teaching cultural issues, maybe reflect on a number of them that took place and see if there's any consistencies there across the board. Recording an event as soon as possible after it has occurred may help preserve important aspects that can be lost to misremembering. So taking some jot notes at the end of a class, um, perhaps using a voice memo on your cell phone to just uh, say a few things to yourself as you're driving home, you know, hands-free, of course, with your earbuds in. Um, and as I re referred to earlier, you could film an event uh, of having an external recording that can ensure the accuracy while still allowing the subjective interpretation that's crucial to this kind of methodology. So let's move on now to examples of reflection. And I'm going to share a couple of my own examples with you. And the question here is, why do you teach the first one? So one of the things we can consider when we begin reflecting is what got me here into teaching in the first place. Sometimes that's very helpful in um, keeping some momentum going if we're feeling a little bit of burnout. So I'm going to share with you, I'll read it to you, um, my reflection that I wrote when I thought back on why I got into teaching and what aspects of my training were important or unimportant and this is, again, in retrospect, because I never reflected on this, pra uh, on this um, process when I was in training. Uh, this doesn't paint a full picture, but it creates a context for me and my beginnings, which were in the link language classroom. So here we go. Excuse me. 
excuse me, just going to move my screen over here so I can take a better look at the words on my screen so I can accurately re reflect for you. Uh, my father, upon hearing that I wanted to become a teacher, said and continued to say to me, those who can, do. Those who can't, teach. And those who can't teach, teach gym. We all have stories. I've left out a lot of my story by telling you this little anecdote. Teaching English for me was a way to get even with my kindergarten teacher who bullied me because I couldn't speak English and encouraged my classmates to ostracize me. Based on all of this, I think that language teachers should be able to empathize or understand their learners, understand how language works, and be able to explain its workings to learners. I would say that learning how language works, the grammar, was a necessary element for me to learn in order to teach it. Morphology, linguistics, less necessary. I think that being formally prepared for understanding different cultures and having an opportunity to teach in a classroom and observe a few teachers, these are experiences I didn't have in my TESOL training, I think these are essential. Learning how to create assessments and use technology are also important. But I say all of these things because I have observed and mentored new teachers and because of my own early career experiences. I would say that passion goes a long way in keeping a teacher's fire alive to learn to be a good teacher. So that is a passage that I wrote, um, not in preparation for today, but uh, when I was uh, writing about why teachers teach and um, what did I think teachers needed to know in order to be uh, successful language teachers. So now I'd like to share with you, and I'm going to share my screen with you in a second, another example of reflection. And this is reflecting in planning. So perhaps in reflecting before uh, action uh, and reflecting uh, on action, which is afterwards. So this is another personal example. And I've kept a blog and I've added to it on and off for a few years. I began this blog um, because I started becoming interested in using technology in the classroom and I wanted to write about it, share, uh, share about it and think through the process. And um, to be honest, I've debated about deleting some of my posts. Some of them are very cringeworthy for me. I don't want to look at them. Uh, they make me uncomfortable when I start reading, but um, I've left them there because they're a true record of what I thought when I wrote them. Um, even though I don't want to revisit them again, I decided if I ever do have the courage to read them all the way through once more, that they should remain there because they do um, show a process of my learning. So I, I wrote a lot about what Schoen called reflecting on action because I was trying out new types of educational technology and I wanted to share the process with others. In this particular post, was part of a speed dating roundtable professional development session. Um, and the participants had asked for a summary of the tools that I had used and how I'd used them. So I decided to write the reflection on my blog and share it that way. I'm glad I wrote it down as I would have had a difficult time recreating this scene down the road. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen with you. And uh, this is my blog and this was a post from uh, October of 2015, and it's called Smashing Breaking News Generator 2 with Capsules, an online time timeline. Uh, I'd like to let you know right away that Capsules is no longer uh, in operation, but um, once we return back to the presentation, I'll show you um, some links to other alternatives for this kind of tool. So I'm gonna scroll down and I'll, I'll read a bit to you from, from this post because um, I, th I think it's an interesting one to, to talk about, um, but also um, I'll be sharing a second one, uh, a second blog post about something else and it won't be in as much detail. So uh, app smashing refers to the process of using two apps together because even though everyone says there's an app for that in ed tech, gaps often exist between what can be done and what a teacher wants to do. 
This was the case when I came across these two apps as my advanced reading and writing class was reviewing tenses. I had been thinking of digital timelines, but wasn't motivated to try one until breaking news generator and capsules showed up separately in my Twitter feed one morning. I began the activity with my class in the computer lab that day. So this is how one of uh, three screens in breaking news generator appears. It's a static tool that you can personalize to suit your needs. The screen capture news page changes as you type your desired content on the left side here. Yes. And images can be uploaded and positioned as well here. Although I have had a lot of fun of keeping this particular uh, image and using it for examples. The date information is key since it will be used to arrange the news stories later on. And so here I start talking about the um, advice. So I'm setting up the, the topic for um, the presentation. So my reflection comes a little bit afterwards. So I did have to describe what the tool was and what the purpose for, it, uh, for my use was. Encourage students to think of a historical event, a story that is in the news at the moment, and a possible news story that might take place in the future. For demonstration purposes, I found it best to begin with a familiar event that is recognized by students. Show students creative common sources for images and demonstrate how to find images according to topic by using the search option on most websites. I've used picography uh, in the example below, which you'll see in a moment, but other sources can be found in my live binders under the tab stock images for videos and presentations. As you circle the lab, so I was doing this activity in a laboratory environment, you can assist students by showing them the differences between writing sentences and writing news headlines, tickers, such as grammatical changes and word omissions. Remind them that even though they might be writing about past events, their news stories should be written as though they are new news. For example, a headline about the Great Wall of China might read, Wall Running Through China Finally Completed, and dated 1644. And so here you see an example of one that I created. Students produce examples that they can then download as images to save and share with you. Students can send these images to you via email or in a shared environment such as Padlet or in Google Docs. You now have a collection of these news stories that can be used for the second part of the task. And here is how to adapt this part of the lesson for multi-level classes or students who are novice to technology. You can give students a number of news stories to create the quicker students will create more stories than the ones who are not as adept at using technology, but everyone produces at least one news story. Challenge the students who have grasped tenses faster to generate news stories, for example, that are repeated over the course of history. This way you have student generated content that can be used as present or past perfect examples for the writing portion of this task later. And here comes my reflection on using this tool. I like this news generator tool a lot, but needed to augment it to review um, tenses with my advanced English learners. For lower levels, use this tool, using this tool alone might be enough of an activity to review the past, present, and future time. And you could share each image with the class and have students compose statements about the news that they see using the present continuous, since the news is always reported live. So I need to meet several outcomes in my course. And combining outcomes into a task is more relevant to students than solely producing assignments. I wanted to combine a review of tenses with writing narratives and exposing my students to the concept of blogging and collaborative writing. And so we also used capsules, which is, as I said, no longer available. And it is, uh, of, but I'll share some other examples with you. Capsules is a virtual timeline. It's free uh, and I won't talk more about it because it no longer exists. So what we did was that students worked together so it was a collaborative activity and the students were responsible for writing a narrative paragraph by summarizing summarizing the events in the timeline within a past present or future time frame and here i've also included um, some of the things that you can have students do you also have um, information about how much prep time and here was an, uh, some of my reflection so i liked this activity because all the content was student generated. It was a task based activity that combined tense review, narratives, and collaborative writing. 
um, I found and was successfully able to use these apps on the same day. Students wrote some funny news stories and they started getting creative. I met a number of my course outcomes in a way that was meaningful to the learners. I was available for assistance, but students were drawing on collective knowledge to work through this task. And everything did not have to be completed in class on the same day. It was easy to break up this task in two parts. It's also adaptable to different levels and abilities. Okay, and so. That was um, my experience with uh, one reflection where I was using my blog to first summarize and then talk about um, what I what I did with the activity and why I um, why I used it and what I found useful. So uh, because I said that um, capsules isn't. Oops, sorry. That capsules isn't used anymore. Um, there are a few. Just make that larger, maybe. There are a few other. Um, oh dear. There we go. A few um, options for you. So there is Time Toast, uh, Office Timeline, and all of these are clickable, but they're also available in the e-learning industry link uh, toward the end of the presentation. There's a hyperlink provided there. Sutori, My Histro, Our Story, Smart Draw, um, Twitter Custom Timelines, Timeline JS, Free Timeline, and Time Glider. So not all of these are free. Uh, for example, Office Timeline uh, is a freemium, so you can get something free, but for a premium, you can, uh, you can pay more. Um, but uh, there's a, a, a list of, of them here that you could try to use if you were interested in using any of them. So, another form of reflection is uh, action research. And uh, I tried an action research project about uh, four years ago. Um, during this action research project, I was using iPads in the reading and writing classroom with advanced uh, English as a English for academic purposes students. So I had three questions that I thought would be interesting to discover the answers to. Um, is technology a motivator to learn more English? What role does technology play when students are studying reading and writing? Uh, can we increase interactivity? And where will this project take me? So those were three questions that I wanted to explore. And um, I'll take you briefly to my blog post. I won't share too much because we've already um, taken up some time with me just doing some reading, but I'll share with you uh, a few things by sharing my screen. Okay, so this was in November of 2015. And as you can see, my, um, my reflection on the blog was also influenced by my students' uh, beliefs about teaching and learning. And what I had done was I had anonymized um, feedback from students in the form of Google Forms. And they filled in this information for me. And I used it to inform myself before and during and also after we had run the pilot, which lasted, I believe we did this for seven no, sorry, 14 weeks. So you can see here that um, by using Google Forms, I was able to collect a lot of anonymous data. And what I had done, I had taken the Google Form and I had embedded it into my LMS at work. And I asked them several questions, um, but I also wanted to learn a lot from the students as well as myself because I had some ideas, but I didn't know if uh, students would share those same ideas. And so, bring us back to the presentation. You can see here I was interested in getting feedback from the students about their um, beliefs about teaching and learning. So um, you can see that the majority of the students were excited or at least willing to use iPads in the classroom on a regular basis. Um, 
but you can also see that there was um, some feedback from one individual that said that they were a little bit nervous about this idea. And um, this helped influence my teaching and my reflection afterwards, uh, as well as during, because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't overwhelming anyone with, um, with information or not doing things that people wanted to do. And this was very important to me. Um, the results were were not bad. Um, I enjoyed the process very much. I learned a lot about how to make reading and writing collaborative, which I've continued to use since I did this action research project. Um, uh, what I also learned by reflecting and by blogging about this and by keeping information um, in Google Forms and, and collecting it from students was to think about not just what I thought, what I believed, but how students were reacting to this because a little bit of technology uh, can be great if you have access to it. Sometimes too much can be overwhelming, but um, there are excellent ideas that I've been able to use and carry forward that I wouldn't have done had I not done this action research project. Okay, so we're going to share uh, a screen one last time. Um, I don't know, we don't have much time to can maybe do all, both uh, sites. So what I'm going to do is I'll take you to the, um, the lesson plan from British Council on using uh, film reviews for teaching. Okay. And now this is another way to reflect. So I'm moving beyond things that I've done myself and perhaps you want to take a lesson plan that um, somebody else has uh, shared with you or that you um, you find that uh, you could use for your own purposes and lesson plans or using a lesson plan is a, is a great place to add reflection while you're teaching so you could take notes in the lesson plan if you print something off like this beforehand of course you might also make notes that offer you suggestions of what direction to go what you might want to be interested in doing. Um, but a lesson plan is, is a great opportunity to do the reflection before action, reflection in action, and then reflection um, on action after the fact. And if you look at this lesson plan and you think of film reviews and you just look at the, uh, the image of the viewers here, this might tell you that maybe this lesson is better for younger individuals, um, not older students, or maybe you want to use it. Maybe you can use this as a, as a jumping board. Um, here's another place for reflecting. What are the goals of your lesson plan to use this? Um, do you believe that this would be the same? You could add those thoughts there. And while you're teaching, you could, um, I see this as a, as using a recipe book. So if you have a well-worn recipe book, sometimes uh, you can find notes in it. Be besides the stains from the food and, and the baking that you have, um, you also see notes like, don't make this again. So perhaps the lesson plan will have a note like that, or um, use more butter, or maybe use with a higher group of learners next time. Sometimes you've baked your uh, cake for too long. so. Uh, maybe you write use less time for that. These are all ref reflective um, behaviors that you can use with your lesson plan. Um, and you can see that there's also copyright. So you might want to think about or make notes on how you can use something like this in your classroom um, that won't uh, break copyright. So um, I know that in schools, if you're playing videos, uh, for example, if the school doesn't own the video, if you're playing it from YouTube and it's not the original poster of the YouTube video, let's say, for example, you're showing a Volkswagen commercial, but it, it, the commercial is not posted by Volkswagen, it's post, reposted by someone else. You can't play that in the classroom. You can share a link to it for students to watch on their own. So we can we can reflect on very simple things but we can reflect on larger things too so this is more of a uh, let's get started um, maybe not write a journal maybe not create a vlog or a blog or do a webinar about it but 
how can I start to think about what I'm doing? Maybe then the lesson plan works out with my um, with my students, and I might decide to move on and uh, share it with my colleagues, uh, do a presentation with them. All this is possible. Reflection doesn't have to be big and it can start small, but as Tom Farrell has said, um, it should be a part of language teacher education. It should be a big role in establishing teacher identity in those first few years. And it, like in my case, um, it helps teachers from stagnating, preventing them from stagnating and trying out uh, new ideas, which was the case for me, to be sure. And then if you are on Twitter or Facebook, maybe you start to participate in different conversations and you'd be surprised how quickly you can collaborate with people, network them, maybe do um, joint collaboration process, which is our um, big reflective pieces. But uh, starting small or going big, neither of them is important. What's important is that we think about what we're doing, we think about what we did and what we'd like to do or how we'd like to do things differently. And of course, these are things that we naturally do, but sometimes just like, um, just like parents forget, oh yes, this is what this kind of condition looks like in a baby. When you have your second child, you forget everything that happened with your first one. It's much the same with teaching. Oh, that's right. I forgot. I didn't like how this worked and I wish I'd made a note of it for myself. It will prevent you and save you some time down the road as well. So these are the references, um, things that I referred to in my uh, webinar today. Um, books that I referred to, the website um, that contains all the options for different timelines in case you're interested in trying out uh, the capsules timeline news generator activity. I've shared a link to my first blog post that I talked with you about, um, uh, Tom Farrell's blog, which has links to all his articles, as well as shown the beginner of reflective practice in action. So thank you very much for your attention in this best practices webinar on reflective practice in the classroom. If you have any questions, I'm reachable. I am on Twitter at the handle at A.M. Bartosik, and I can also be reached at my University of Toronto email listed here. <laughs>